Good morning, musicians, graduates, parents, friends. I'm so glad you're all here today. What an amazing crowd. Thank you for having me. I'm very honored to be here. You guys are the future of the music business. You know that, right? The future is yours. So uh, they asked me to come here and speak today, and I was very honored to do that because I'm so interested in the future of music. As uh, they were talking about in the speech earlier, um, I have my own charity now, Adopt the Arts, and we're doing quite well. We've donated over a thousand instruments to the Los Angeles Unified School District. But what I'd like to do today is try to give you a little inspiration and some of my backstory and how I got to where I am today, and you know, let you guys kind of take that in and, and see how you can morph that into your life. It's gonna be different for all of us. Um, you know, I think for myself, I came up here to Hollywood in a time before the internet, before social media, when we used to make a little thing called a flyer. We'd hand it out to our friends and say we're playing. <laughs> there was no Facebook. Basically, I drove up here in 1979 in my Rambler station wagon, which I paid about $40 for. But the one thing I knew about that station wagon is it could fit my drum kit, so that's all I cared about, and I had a killer stereo. <laughs> I, uh, I graduated high school in 1978 in uh, Orange County, and I used to come up here and play on weekends and tell my mom I was gonna go stay over at my friend's house, and we used to play a club, club called Gazzari's over on the Sunset Strip, which is now the Key Club. And I guess the Key Club just shut down and Jay-Z Jay -Z just bought that, so it's now gonna be a different name. But where the Key Club was, was a club called Bizarre's Crazy Horse West. And I used to sneak in there with my band. I had a band called Prophecy. We were a three-piece band. And I, we loved Hendrix and all the great three-piece bands of that time, ZZ Top. So we emulated a lot of that. and. Uh, and I had a huge drum kit, like now I play a lot less, but in those days, I had this massive octopus drum kit that fit in my Rambler station wagon. <laughs> so I'd come up here and play these clubs, but I got, as soon as I got to Hollywood, I got the bug. You know, I saw what was happening on the strip. I met so many great musicians. There was a lot of pretty girls. All that stuff worked for me. <laughs> and uh, so I started playing these clubs, and then as soon as I graduated high school, my band Prophecy, I said to the other guys in the band, I said, hey man, I want to go to Hollywood, that's where it's happening. I got to be in Hollywood, I want to make it in the music business. And the guitar player said, well, I got my girlfriend, and I got a job at the bank, and I don't know, man. I'm like, okay, see you later. <laughs> so I left those guys behind, and I had to, because I really felt down deep inside that my destiny was being in Los Angeles, being in Hollywood, being with the great musicians that have come from all over the world, which a lot of you have come from all over the world, right? All over America. To come here to this great vortex of energy and music and art, which is Hollywood, Los Angeles, California. And so I came up here, I moved into a little one bedroom apartment with two other drummers. And we used to like mark on our milk carton, you know, that's mine, don't touch that. And that was big if we even had milk, but usually it was Kraft macaroni and cheese, top, top ramen, and stuff like that. And I remember my mother being really worried, you know, of course, as mothers are. Matt, you have to have something to fall back on. And I would say, no, Mom, I'm going to make it in the music business. And she'd say, well, I think that you should really try to do maybe a chef or work at a restaurant or something. And I'm like, no, Mom. I'm gonna make it in the music business. <laughs> so my whole goal and my, my manifestation of my career had always been at the forefront of my mind. And I wasn't a very good cook, for that matter. <laughs> so I could scramble some eggs, but that was about it. So I just kept on my path, you know. And in about 1979, I went down to a little club that's now the Viper Room. It used to be called The Central. And I heard about a, a Tuesday night jam night there. So I went in there and I signed up on the sheet. And, you know, I was 19 years old. And they were all like, hey kid, you know, what's your turn? So finally, a couple of weeks of doing that, I finally got my turn to get up and play drums, which was at about 1.45 in the morning, last call. 
But this guitar player jumped on stage with me, a guy named Greg Wright, who ended up playing with Michael Jackson on the Victory Tour. And we jammed, and uh, he turned around and said to me, man, you're a great drummer. And he said, you want to go on tour? And I said, when? He said, next week. And I said, how much? He said, I didn't even say how much. He said, 200 bucks. I said, amazing. I felt like I just won the lottery. I was making 200 bucks a week. So we got up, we got in a Rambler, uh, not my Rambler station wagon, and a van. We had a 40 ton line van, which didn't run that well, and we had to trade off driving. And we headed out the 10 freeway towards Texas. And my first gig was in El, pa El Paso, Texas, and then we played all the way down the 10 freeway. We were another three-piece band. Greg was a left-handed guitar player, and he played the strings upside down, like Albert King, you know, with the high E on top. He was amazing. Look him up on uh, YouTube. Incredible musician. So that was my first road trip. And I, I hung out a lot in New Orleans, and I used to go see all the great musicians down in the French Quarter. And, and, and that was it for me. I was in. I was 19. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not stopping. At that time, I came home with no money because I'd spend it all on the road just trying to eat. And I, I, I started heading out to the clubs and hanging around clubs because I felt like I needed to meet every musician in town. And my way of doing that would be I'd just walk up to a guy that looked like a musician and go, hey man, what do you play? <laughs> you know? And they'd say, I'm a guitar player, I'm a bass player. And I would say, let's jam. And before I knew it, I was in 10 bands at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I was. And I got the nickname, Matt the Mercenary. Because I would play your rehearsal for 25 bucks, and I'd play your gig for 50. <laughs> so, so I was like, the, whatever I could do not to have a real job. You know, I just wanted to play music. At that point, my Ram Rambler station wagon had broken down, and I bought a Volkswagen Bug. <laughs> but I took the front seat out so I could fit my bass drum in the, driver, in the passenger seat. <laughs> it was awesome. And then, uh, and it was missing two fenders too, which was a really good look. But, uh, so I drove around from rehearsal room to rehearsal room to rehearsal room. And it was all about playing with as many musicians, meeting as many people. And I'd still say that today to you guys. You know, don't just meet on Facebook. You know, hey man, you know, I'm, I'm, I got my thing and I want to come over. Get together and hang out. I think we need to build the, the vibe back up in Hollywood. When I was coming up, Sunset Strip was on fire. I still think that's possible. There's a lot of stuff going on over in Silver Lake on the east side. There's a click, you know, there's a scene, and that's why I came here. There was a lot of musicians that were in a scene, and we all played in different bands, but we were all a community. We built our community. So, basically, at that point, I met a, I met a producer, a guy just out on the clubs, and he said, hey, I heard about you. Would you want to come do some sessions? And I'm like, what? Well, I, did, I didn't even know what that word was. <laughs> it's like, um, I just said, yeah. And he offered me like crazy money, like, you know, 300 bucks a day. I was like, what? And uh, so I ended up going and playing with a big producer named Michael Lloyd, who produced songs like, You light up my life, you give me hope. You know that one? So it really wasn't my forte, but I was making 300 bucks. So I ended up playing with Sean Cassidy. If anyone remembers Sean Cassidy. Yeah. And then I got a gig with a, with a, a very famous singer named Gladys Knight and the Pips. And I walked in, I was the only white guy there, but they said, I hope you're funky. You know what I mean? So I was like, I worked on my funk chops too. I worked on my, my soul grooves. I worked on everything I could to work. You know, I wanted to make sure that when someone said, can you play that? I had played it. And then, uh, soon after that, I played with Linda Carlisle, that just came out of the Go-Go's. And I did a lot of sessions, and I started working, and people started knowing my name, and then along, along came, uh, I was actually, while I was doing sessions, I was playing five nights a week in Top 40. So I would go from the session, which I think I moved up to a, station, a Volkswagen station wagon at this point, because I'd made a couple bucks. So I had a station wagon, and I would go from the session, and I'd go straight to Black Angus in Pomona and play five sets a night. And I'd do that five nights a week. But I made 250 bucks a week. And I'd play and I'd drive back and forth, back and forth, go to rehearsals. And then 
I started playing at Disneyland, which I heard was the best union game in town. But the problem was I had to put my hair in a ponytail and wear a really horrible suit. And I'd come out of this thing in the ground and there would be like, you know, I'd come out and there'd be like Mickey Mouse standing there. And I'd be like, ah! You know? I'd had a late night the night before. It was like, freak me out. You know? <laughs> but I met some amazing musicians there. I met a 15-year-old Josh Freeze, who was standing behind me one day. He said, hey, dude. And I said, what's going on? He said, hey, man, I broke my snare drum. I got a snare drum for you. Lo and behold, later on, I find out Josh Freeze's dad does all the entertainment at Disneyland. Another great friend and great drummer that I met on the other stage of his land was Greg Bissonnette. Who, a lot of you guys know Greg, Greg Bissonnette. One of the most talented musicians and drummers out there. He's amazing. So I, I started to gain a lot of friends. At that time, I was playing at the Marriott Airport Hotel. And I was in this little bar and I came out and I heard this girl playing piano. Amazing, I, I look over and I, I see Tori Amos sitting at the piano. And I walk over to, to her and I say, who the heck are you? I said something else, but I said, oh my God, you're amazing. We started a band called Why Can't Tori Read? Put out one album. Basically, I was with her for two years. And in those days, I had a, I had a different haircut than even the videos. My haircuts always morphed into the music styles I was doing. I had kind of a red pompadour, very new wave. You know, because in those days it was a lot about the look, what your vibe was, your talent, if you were easy to get along with. There's a lot of other aspects that you gotta remember being in a band. It's not just, hey man, I can play 5,000 drum fills. You know, no one cares about that. They wanna know that you're on time, you have good time, you got a cool hairdo, and you, you, you know, and all that stuff. So I did all that. At that point, we started showcasing for all these big labels. This was my first letdown in the music business. Two years I was with Tori. The record company came in, and I'll say his name so if you guys see him, you can say, Matt Sorn says, you're not such a nice guy. <laughs> his name's Jason Flom. He's a very famous a &R guy. He signed a lot of big bands, Kid Rock, The Coors. He said, Tori, you're really great, but fire the band. So I spent two years of my life working with Tori, and I got fired by the a &R guy. So, I'm just giving you guys a little insight on the music business. It's not easy, okay? A lot of you're gonna hear a lot of no's before you hear a yes. Especially nowadays, the business is even harder. But, you know, I went, I went home with my tail between my legs, but I did not quit. What I did was I got right back up and I auditioned another band called Jeff Paris on Polygram Records. And I made another album on Polygram. And then I kept moving. Through that, I heard about an audition for this band called The Cult. I don't know if you guys are maybe too young to remember The Cult, but in those days, The Cult was the coolest thing moving. It was I was living in Hollywood where everyone had really big hair and were wearing cowboy boots on the outside of their pants, okay? And uh, CeCe DeVille was just walking Sunset Boulevard, handing out flyers going, I got a band called Poison! So, I was like, that just doesn't sound cool to me. So, another little tidbit of information that I always try to do in my career. Make sure my resume looks really cool and don't do anything that's gonna jeopardize that. Belinda Carlisle, Sean Cassidy, I'm not sure, but that was my early formative years, and I think it's kind of cool now. It sounds kind of funny, but it's cool. <laughs> so, but when I started getting in bands, I wanted to make sure that my credibility was a lot like being in, in the coolest bands possible to keep my career going. You know, I was offered gigs from bands like Survivor, Warrant, Winger, and I said I'd rather starve than playing Winger. I just did. <laughs> I would rather eat Top Ramen for the rest of my life, you know, than playing Winger. I'm sorry, that's just my... <laughs> or Warrant. <laughs> but now they're cool, I don't, I don't get it. It's like Warrant, Warrant, yeah! But um, I was like, no. And I heard about this band called The Cult, 
And at the time, Wildflower, Love Removal Machine, She Sell Sanctuary, the band was out of England. They were very like goth, cool, innovative, groovy stuff, right? So I said, hey man, I'll go audition for that. And what did I do? I learned every album they ever made, note for note. And made sure I didn't have my cowboy boots on the outside of my pants. I wore all black. And I walked into the audition and I got the gig. And basically I played with the band. They turned around and they said, we'll give you the gig in the cult, but you have to quit smiling so much. <laughs> so I used to be like a happy drummer guy, right? Like, And then I morphed into those horrible faces that you see in Guns N' Roses. <laughs> that was all part of the entertainment. So, I got in the cult and I said, so when are we going on tour? And they said, we're going on tour in four days. We're opening for Metallica. <laughs> on a little tour called Justice For All. When Metallica had all dudes in the audience. 99.9% .9 dudes. Which I have no concept of that. I, I never understood that. Why do you want to be in a band and play for a bunch of dudes? It's like, what? I'm met because I'm metal. Well, good for you. I prefer women in the audience. That's why I play rock and roll. I come from the school of Jagger, Robert Plant, those guys, you know. John Bonham, he liked girls. So, um, I played in this band, The Cult, and it was really cool because I used to set up two pang symbols so I didn't get hit by shoes. I had two pangs. If you ever open for Metallica, I highly recommend that. That'd be advice I would give today. Or any of those metal bands. I had two, I had two pang symbols, and believe me, Thank God. You know, bottles of stuff I don't even want to tell you. And shoes and stuff. And I went out, the first night I went out, we opened for Metallica. We were in uh, Vancouver, Washington. Or no, Vancouver, uh, BC, sorry. Backstage, backstage was a guy named Steven Tyler. Uh, Tommy Lee, they were all up there doing the records, and I go up to Steven Tyler like an idiot, and I go, I saw your band when I was 16, and you guys are so cool. I love you. He goes, you just made me feel really old. And that was like 20 years ago. <laughs> so, so long story short, I go out on the road with, with, with the cult, and I have the most amazing time. I'm on a tour bus, can you believe it? I've now graduated from the Econoline band. I'm on a tour bus, I have a bunk. You know, it's like a pillow, and there's a TV and it's like, I'm, I'm arrived, I'm done. This is it, rock and roll. I'm hanging out with Lars, we're partying, it's all good. Lars just wants to hang out with me because my band gets chicks. So, you know, it's like, hey dude, can I hang with you? Yeah, okay, come on little guy. So, so I love him, he's a very good friend. I say that with him in all, you know, respect. Uh, very rich too, by the way, for a drummer. <laughs> um, so I end up touring with the Cole. Very last night, I, I, I'm playing at a place called Universal Amphitheater. And I, I'm, probably some of you have read this story, but uh, my very last night with, with the Cole on a year and a half tour, we're on the road for a year and a half, in Walk Slash and Duff Kagan from a little band called Guns N' Roses. <laughs> I'm like, no way did those guys write that album. That's not even possible, being that wasted to write those songs, no way. <laughs> so, they come in, and I remember seeing to my girlfriend at the time, I said, hey honey, man, look at those two characters, maybe I could play with that band. And uh, lo and behold, a couple weeks later, I get a call from Slash at my mom's house, because at that time I was what I called a vagabond musician. Not only was I on the rock tour, but I was on the couch tour. <laughs> but before I was on the rock tour, I did many couch tours. Have you guys done that? It's really cool. You should do it. It's called paying your dues, man. <laughs> so I did this, I did this, uh, this gig at Universal, and I get a call from Slash, and he says, hey man, we, uh, 
we really dug your drumming and we want you to come play with the band, do the record. Lo and behold, uh, I go up there and then they tell me that the original drummer, Steven, is, is out of the band and they want to ask me to join the, join the group. So here's another piece of advice for you. When you're already in one really cool group and they're paying you really well, now you have what's called leverage. So as you, especially if you're a drummer, any drummers out there? Get a good lawyer. Okay. Now, drummers get screwed. We do. Let's just be honest. We're in the back. Stay back there. Don't give them any light either. Okay. So, if you want to make it in the music business, and especially be a drummer, you got to get you got to get your smarts on. So I thought, hmm, I'm already in the cult. He's just asked me to join the band. He's going to try to pay me a salary. And just something came out of my mouth. Okay, make me a member. And I went, what the heck did I just say? <laughs> he goes, they go, all right, yeah, cool. So I got a lawyer. My lawyer called their lawyer, and we negotiated a contract, which was the first time I'd really become a member of something. The cult, I was a side man. I got paid a salary, right? But I negotiated my way up. You guys, there's a lot more to being a great musician and being in the music business. It, you learn along the way that a lot of this stuff, the business part of it, is the hardest part. It's the part you're not gonna like. <laughs> it's the part you're gonna go, I wanna quit. But don't, because the beauty of it is when you're on stage playing music for thousands and thousands of people, that's the reward. But the business part is tough. So I got a good lawyer. My lawyer negotiated the deal. And long story short, I became a member of Guns N' Roses in 1990. At the age of, at the age of 30. Thank you. And that was crazy, you know, that, that really started the wild times in my life, like things got crazy and the band was huge. My first game was 140,000 seat uh, stadium in Rock and Rio de, de Janeiro. We played two nights sold out. Can you imagine? And Axel didn't show for rehearsal, so that was a little scary. <laughs> but, and then he said about five minutes before I went on, do a drum solo. So, and then I went into this drum solo and I didn't want to stop because I had 140,000 people. They were all mine. And I had every spotlight. <laughs> and they were like, stop. And I'm like, get out of here, beat it. <laughs> so, long story short, Guns N' Roses, you guys have probably all read the stories. We, we basically imploded towards the end. Because what happened was, uh, you know, there's a lot of money. There was a lot of ego. There was a lot of stuff going on within the, the band that, that broke us apart. But... I look back at it in great pride. We played all over the world, we played the biggest stadiums in the world. So after that point, I didn't really feel like being in a band for a while, so I morphed into a record producer, and I produced an album for an artist named Poe. And we did a track called Angry Johnny, which was a number two, uh, top 10 hit. And then I did, uh, I did six film scores. So I started thinking about the ancillary of my life. And you know, as a musician, you have to keep your career going. So what can you do to keep moving, keep your career uh, you know, alive? And since then, I've become much more of, a, of an outside thinker. I, you know, I have my own charity, Adopt the Arts. I have two separate businesses that I do. I do a vitamin, believe it or not. But all these business sense and all these smarts came through music and art. And I really stress to the world of my education system that Music and art is innovation and creative thought and is really the future of the world. And music can save the world. And I do this with all my charities. And that is the truth. If you look at the greats, John Coltrane, he believed that Love Supreme was the universal language, that we all speak that language. The greats, Bob Marley, one love. Uh, of course, John Lennon. So I. Later, and then after my party years of Guns N' Roses, I morphed into a, a different person because I had to recreate myself. And in the music business, we all have to do that. You know, you got to come up with a, I got a hat, you know, I got my hair a little bit, straight, you know. 
New Jack, you know, the whole thing, the whole package has got to morph. And you got to move with the times, you got to be modern. So at that point, I came up with this idea of putting this band together. After a friend's death, I called Slash and Duff and I said, hey, I want to play this tribute to my friend Randy Castillo, who was a great drummer friend of mine, who was in a band called Ozzy Osbourne. He passed away and I thought, drummers never get the front page of the paper when they die, do they? It's always like, you know, some singer or whatever. So I said, I'm going to throw an event and I'm going to make people recognize Randy Castillo. So I invited Slash and Dove. And Steven Tyler got up on stage with us. And we played and we sold out the key club in like a minute. <laughs> it was awesome. And the next day Slash called, he said, okay, it's time. Let's do something. Axel had already gone off and called his other group, Guns N' Roses. And we formed a band called Velvet Revolver. Spent two years looking for a singer. Not fun. Not fun at all. <laughs> but what we did do is we persevered. Every day Slash would say, be at rehearsal at 12 o'clock, we're going to rehearse till 8 o'clock. We rehearse eight hours a day, every day, five days a week. These are guys that don't need to work. They're all millionaires. Okay? Slash wrote Sweet Child of Mine. You get my drift? <laughs> he still gets paid. He doesn't need to do this. But I'll tell you why he's doing it. Because he loves rock and roll, and he loves music, and he loves playing his guitar. And I love him for that. And I love Duff for the same reason. We got together and we were passionate about putting a band together that was going to win. What we did is we got in there, we auditioned singers from all over the world for two years. We documented it on a, on a documentary called The Rise of Velvet Revolver. You can pull it up on YouTube. <clears throat> At that point, we got a big opportunity to do a film score called uh, The Hulk with Ang Lee directing. And, uh, in came Scott Wyman, which we all went, uh-oh. <laughs> but let me tell you about singers. Can't live with them, can't live without them. <laughs> now, any singers down here, don't let them get their own dressing room, whatever you do. That's trouble, number one. <laughs> we call it LSD, lead singer disease. So we got Scott, but then someone threw a big old bag of money at us. And we're like, oh, he'll do. 